Welcome to Lyme Time. I'm Allie from the Tick Chicks. We are all more than Lyme disease and chronic illness, and together we stand with you to overcome and rise. I'll bring you closer to the experts in cutting edge treatments and even a few unexpected ways of healing. I'll ask the questions you want answers to regarding Lyme disease and successful ways of getting you closer to 100%. We are in this together and will not be defined by Lyme. Today, I'm very excited to have John Cole, and he owns a business called Northwoods Tick Pest Control and Tick Control Company. Um, uh, I've got to start that over because I just, sorry. No, nope, it's okay. okay. Here we go. Today, I'm so excited to have John Cole here. He is the owner of the company Northwoods Tick Control, and it's a pest control service. And basically, John was a former TV photojournalist who had decided to change careers because of being bitten by a tick. So welcome, John. I know you have a lot to offer our audience. And I want to just say, Let's start by your own personal story and how you landed on this show right now. Yeah. So like a lot of people, uh, you know, I was one of those people that got bitten by a tick. I, I do remember it. And I remember reaching up behind my left ear and feeling a bug uh, behind my ear. I was getting ready to take a shower after riding my bike. And I thought, wow, that's strange. And I had reached up and just pulled it off with my hand, not knowing anything about ticks, anything about bugs or anything. And I just looked at it and I thought, oh, that's gross. And I just put it in the toilet and flushed it down, not knowing, you know, what it was or, you know, anything about it. And I had a period of time, like two to three weeks where I had a headache, fatigue, malaise. Um, and it was in the middle of the summer. So my primary care doc said, oh, you know, it's like a summer flu or something. And I didn't, again, I didn't connect the dots, tick bite, not feeling well. I had no idea what ticks were, you know, at the time. Um, so anyway, I think I remember doing like a week or so of antibiotics, like clarithromycin or something. And just because I hadn't gotten better and I did start to feel better. So after that, I started to feel better. And then I just kind of figured that was just, you know, a viral infection or something that had nothing to do with the, with the tick. Um, and then fast forward, you know, four, five, six years and my left knee would constantly swell up and I had what they called water on the knee, fluid on my knee. And I would go to the uh, sports medicine doctor and he would tap it and drain it. And like the next day it would be just as bad. So anyway, I went to go see an orthopedic surgeon, saw the surgeon, and he had said, yeah, there's a problem with your knee. There's probably torn meniscus or something in there. So, you know, and I asked, should we do like a CT scan or something to take or an MRI? And he said, we're going to have to scope it anyway. We might as well just go in and have a look and, and see what the problem is. So I went in and had my left knee. I had arthroscopic surgery on my left knee. And I remember waking up in recovery and asking them, you know, did you find it? Did you get it? And I remember the surgeon saying, well, we really didn't find much in there. You know, a little bit of osteoarthritis. Um, other than that, we just kind of cleaned things up and uh, you should be good. And what I didn't know was during the process when they do arthroscopic surgery, is they give you a steroid injection in the fluid when they work on your joint to help lower the inflammation. So I was okay for, you know, four, five, six, eight months. And then it kind of came back again. And it was just relentless. It just, you know, it would go away and then come back. And of course, as a photographer, being in the field working, it made it very difficult to do my job because I had this swollen knee that was constantly bothering me. Um, and then fast forward, you know, again, a few more years, I just kind of slogged it out and did what I needed to do. And then, uh, it got to the point again, where I really couldn't walk well and it was constantly swollen. So I went to another, uh, another doctor 
and he did an ultrasound and, and could see that there was fluid in there. So we tapped it and drained it and so forth. And he had sent the fluid off to pathology and it came back and said, Oh, we think you have gout. So mm. long story short, they said I had gout. Well, I had no history of gout, but I said, okay, well, how can I manage this without taking medication? So I went vegetarian, purine free diet, sugar free diet for uh, probably a year and saw very little change in my knee. And by that time I had gotten more tired, more fatigued, you know, and I was, we had bought a new house. We had a, a new daughter, a, you know, a new child. And it was just difficult to do the daily routines. And uh, I had struggled with my primary care about like, what do we do? You know, what is this? And I do remember them. And I remember saying, you know, I think you should have a, a Lyme disease test. And they said, okay, well, we'll do a Lyme disease test. So we did that, came back negative. And I insisted on, and that first one was the ELISA. And then I insisted on doing a Western blot. And that one came back again, negative. Um, what I didn't realize was it didn't read all the protein lines to me. All it said to my primary care was seronegative, just negative. It didn't have results for her mm -hmm. to read. Um, anyway, long story short, I got to the point where I was physically and emotionally drained to the point where I was out of work on short term disability because I was struggling so much with work. And my primary care said, uh, you know, we think you should see someone. And at the time, I, well, I'll see whoever you think I need to see because I'm not getting any better. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, I think you need to see a therapist because you're awfully depressed. And I'm like, yeah, I am really depressed because I'm really sick. <laughs> Right. You know, so anyway, fast forward, went to go see a therapist, great guy. Um, and I think it was second or third session where he said, have you had a Lyme disease test? Unreal. Yeah. And I said, well, yeah, I had two. And they both came back negative. And he was the first person that told me, well, there's a there's a different test. And I said, well, what do you mean a different test? So he told me about Igenix at the time. So I did some research. And of course, you go online, you read and you're like, oh, you know, if you read comments on blogs, it's like, oh, Igenix is this lab that gives everybody a positive. But the more you read and the more you understand the science and the testing and the protein lines, you realize that there's something wrong with the testing. So long story short, uh, I sought out a naturopathic doctor mm -hmm. by way of my therapist's recommendation. And at that point, that naturopathic doctor was able to draw my blood and ship it off to Igenix. And of course, it came back positive. So we started a long-term antibiotics and herbal remedies at that point. And gradually, over a period of a couple of years, probably two years around that line, I, I started to realize that I was feeling better. And there were fewer bad days and, and more good days at that point. And now I, I'm not on antibiotics, uh, not on any, you know, maintenance or anything. And I'm just doing my thing. I've got, you know, bumps and bruises and aches and pains like anybody else would, I guess. And I just keep doing what I do. Yeah, that's a very interesting story. Lots of similarities, you know, with yeah. every story I hear, I can tap into a couple of things. When you mentioned gout, I remember yeah. my husband in the beginning, it's like you, because I couldn't walk. Mine was not knee, mine was foot. But yeah. he's like, you got gout, you know? It's like, gout, what is gout? No, I don't have that. Yeah, I don't have the and, King's disease. What is this? I'm not sitting around eating. <laughs> I mean, I was willing to go here. with it. But yeah. then, you know, so I, I relate to that. I relate to um, just so much of it. And I want to know, from the beginning, from your first, onset of symptoms yeah. to your diagnosis how long was that so it was bitten in 2002 is and then i was technically diagnosed i had the uh Igenix test in 2014 okay so. all right 
Yeah. And then you did some antibiotics and, and, and did what probably most of us out here uh, start doing when we get the correct diagnosis. Yeah. And I do, I do have to just say, I do love hygienics because they're not only testing for Lyme, they're testing for yeah. all kinds of tick-borne illness. Yeah. And were you in Maine at the time that you got bit by the tick? I was. And okay. again, it was, you know, early 2000s. And probably not a lot of testing. Yeah, I didn't know anything point. about ticks. I didn't know about that you could get sick by tick bite. I didn't, I, I don't even remember knowing what Lyme disease was really. And, and did you grow up there? Uh, so there's a big dividing line in Maine from Southern Maine to Northern Maine. Okay. And in Southern Maine, uh, the Eastern black legged tick or the deer tick is very, uh, the population is very high here in Southern Maine In Northern Maine, because it is pretty much a different climate, they struggle to survive. So the very few in Northern Maine, I had never seen a tick before. And again, I'm an Eagle Scout. I spent my life camping with my brothers outside, never saw a tick. The first tick I saw was again, that bug that bit me behind my ear, you know? Wow. Unreal. Yeah. I figured uh, you'd be a great source to talk with because you are doing work actively in Maine. And as we yeah. all know, Maine is sort of famous yeah, for, a, for ticks and yeah. uh, Lyme disease and, and yet I have friends that live, that have homes there and they're still trying to figure out ways to protect themselves and their animals from ticks. Because yeah. again, as you know, the most treacherous ones are those little tiny nymph ticks that you can barely see with the naked eye. Yeah. Um, so I want to, I want to ask what you, who is your typical client? So my typical client, believe it or not, is a mom between 29 and 45 uh, moms, you know, uh, there's a, again, a significant group of pet owners, but most of the time they're parents, you know, and usually, I don't know why, but it's usually the mom that mm -hmm. I end up dealing with. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I do know that, you know, in our Lyme community, that children are our top uh, population of Lyme disease. And often they will have that pain in the knee yeah. and that fluid on the knee, which is very confusing as a parent. So it's nice to know that the parents are getting involved and being preventative. Um, now let's talk a little bit about chemical versus natural. Yeah. And I want your honest opinion yeah. about, you know, people's best lines of defenses and yeah. maybe even some products out there that are on the natural side that would be into consideration for us. Yeah. yeah. So as somebody who has been bitten and gotten sick and recovered, you know, in the beginning, I was very fearful of ticks. I didn't, you know, as I was getting better, I started to read more about them and trying to understand, you know, where they live, their habitat, their habits, not knowing that I was going to get into this, but just because I was very curious, how could this happen to me? Mm -hmm. You know, so as far as preventative, I don't want to be bitten again. I don't want to be reinfected again. So for me personally, during the season when I'm working outside, I am head to toe uh, insect shield treaty clothing, socks, long pants, long sleeves. Um, I wear gaiters that cover the gap between my boots and my pants. Those are also treated because I am in active tick habitat. You know, they call me to come out there and that's, you know, what I'm entering at that point. But as far as my opinion, personally, um, synthetics are, from what I know of, from the entomologist that I follow, far more effective in controlling deer ticks. Um, dog ticks tend to be a little more rugged. They're like little robots. They can live in crushed stone, dirt, uh, you know, mulch around your plants and so forth, where deer ticks seem to be more sensitive and they need that moisture. They need that shade. Mm -hmm. So that being said, um, you may know tickencounter.org, 
who runs a great nonprofit out of the University of Rhode Island, and their entomologist's name is Dr. Tom Mathers. And he is the tick guy. And I follow his protocol. He has taken the time to study the products, their effectiveness, the process to treat, um, going to the point where they will treat yards and go in and quest and actively you know, search for ticks afterwards. So he tests a lot of the organics, he tests a lot of the synthetics, and he's come up with a protocol. And that protocol is the protocol that I follow, which is a perimeter only application of a synthetic containing bifenthrin. And this isn't something that you need to do, you know, five, four, five, six times a year. This is something, you know, the most cost effective time to treat the spring and fall. You know, if you can afford a, a spring and fall application, chances are pretty good that you're not going to have a tick problem in your yard. That said, all properties are very unique and different. So some have a very heavy uh, tick habitat on their property, never been treated before. That is very, uh, you know, again, sprawl and they have some new homes that are built right up against old pasture land that have been tick habitat for a long time. So you have to crash that population in order to control it. Mm -hmm. That said, a perimeter application of a synthetic like bifenthrin should take care of the problem. Again, uh, you know, I'm a master applicator with the main board of pesticide control. So I know all the rules and regs and so forth that we need to follow, which are very important, especially in Maine. Uh, bifenthrin is a synthetic that will kill lobsters if it gets to groundwater, groundwater gets to the ocean, then we'll have a problem mm -hmm. because that is Maine. You know, lobsters are Maine and we can't risk that, uh, you know, habitat. So at this point, uh, perimeter applications of bifenthrin, spring and fall. And then I also use and install the TCS boxes, which are tick control system boxes. So they're rodent boxes with bait. There's a little bait block in there. And then there's two cotton wicks that are treated with Fipronil. And Fipronil is the active ingredient in Frontline for your cats and dogs. So mice and chipmunks, rodents will go in one end of the box to get something to eat. But in order to get past it, to get something to eat, they have to walk under that wick that's treated with Fipronil. That mm -hmm. treats them, removes the ticks from their body. Um, and when they go back to their nest, oftentimes those nests are infested with deer ticks. Um, it stands a better chance to help reduce the number of ticks in that nest on their offspring, thus reducing the ticks in your yard. So okay. those boxes are very effective. Um, they're a little expensive, but you know I think the TCS box route really is probably the most uh, responsible way to deal with tick control at this point. Mm -hmm. The pros and cons are, it does work well. The cons are, it's expensive. Uh, we're back into the expensive line again for each of us. I understand that, you know, um, but, you know, if you're in a, in a, in a place where you have great concern and you have a lot of traffic maybe coming, the comings and goings of animals during the night or what have you, or just people in your trying to be outside in your own beautiful yard, yeah. uh, I would think it would be a, an expense that we would be willing to take. I mean, I sort of do the cheap man's version of what you just said, meaning yep. the tick tubes. Yep. You've probably seen those. Um, and I'll just scatter the, I'll put those against the house and near leafy piles and things they work. like that. Yeah. They work. It takes the only difference really between a tick tube and a TCS box is there's bait in the TCS box. So you're drawing the rodents in, mm -hmm. whereas with the tick tubes, it's passive. You know, they may be walking by and go, oh, hey, look at this stuff. Oh, this looks cozy. Let's bring this home. 
so there's more of an active role you're using an attractant for the rodents so you're mm -hmm. bringing them versus just kind of hoping to put that along the pathway but i also use tick tubes too so every property gets an individual you know plan i try to when i meet with the customers i try to come up with a plan that they're comfortable with you know that that meets their their needs but also gives them you know you need to be frank about the protection that they have if they have children if they have pets uh, their risk level is much higher so mm -hmm. whereas if they're retired and they just garden occasionally but they don't have vast amounts of gardens and they're not spending much time out in their backyard other than sitting on their patio their risk level is lower you know so I try to take into account all these these different things when I come up with a plan for somebody. But those are some of the tools that I have. And I'm sure that it, there's an expense because what the, the chemical that you're using yep. is probably handled best by a professional. And you know exactly where to lay that down and, and you know how to apply it on all sorts of different, you know, rocks, trees, sh bushes, and all of that. And I think the homeowner is probably just saying, do whatever you can. Some people, yeah. Because I want to be able to enjoy my yard. And I want my indoor pets to be able to go outside. My dogs run around a bit and everything. And I don't want to have to think too much about them coming back inside. Now, let's say you did spray a perimeter and somebody has a dog that goes in and out. Yep. How closely do they have to watch them once you've sprayed? Yeah, so the EPA says, and, the, and again, they, they monitor and they test these products. They say that two hours after a, a synthetic like bifenthrin is put down, again, it, it's all dependent on wind, on sun, on the moisture, the humidity. So I tell people a minimum of two hours. When I spray through, there's two hours where nobody should enter or exit that area. Um, because it hasn't dried. Once it dries, we're fortunate that bifenthrin is very stable. It doesn't move or it doesn't translocate to different places. Um, it stays where it's put. That's why, again, hiring a qualified applicator that understands the rules and the why rather than somebody who's just interested in, yeah, I think I know how to do it. I'll, I'll just spray. We should spray everything. And I worry because again, in Maine, it, it's our, we're known for our outdoors and our environment. And it's important for applicators again, to understand that while we do have a job to do and there are rules that we follow, we also live here and we have to be good stewards for the environment and good stewards for our state and our planet because we're here too you know and our children are going to be here too so there's a fine line between what is you know prudent as far as tick control goes you know uh sure i've been to properties before where they are abutting you know wetland areas and i'm like listen this this area is always going to be a problem for you so we can't spray here because it's too close to a wetland you need to understand that and, you know, maybe move part of your area that you're trying to recreate to, to another area that's sunnier, that has less humidity so that you're safer, you know, um, that is a better alternative than somebody trying to spray an area that's close to a wetland for sure. So on average, what percentage do you think that you are able to reduce the tick population in somebody's yard? Yep. So again, we're very, very fortunate that Dr. Tom Mathers has spent years studying these protocols. And we know that a perimeter application of bifenthrin is very effective in reducing the number of ticks on a property. Uh, far more effective than, you know, some of the ecos, some of the other uh, organic botanicals like cedar oil and a few of the other things well they may deter they're not a you know technically an insecticide so again because of the risk associated with deer ticks we have to look at 
what's it going to take to keep these people safe in their backyard, you know? And again, I tell people you can either just avoid this area and know that you need to, or we need to take evasive action if ticks are on people or pets. And that's the thing. I'll show up at some properties and they're like, we're just really worried about ticks. And I get it. I'm worried about ticks too. But you've got a, a, a lawn that's cut to, you know, two and a half inches. You don't have any shrubs. You don't have any shade. There are, should be no ticks here. And I also feel good at least telling people that, that listen, you shouldn't have to worry about it at your property. You know, mm -hmm. the chances are pretty few and far between. Again, a chipmunk, a mouse, a uh, squirrel may come in and drop a tick here and you may have an issue, but your property is relatively low as far as, you know, the risk level associated with that. Yeah. And I, I feel better knowing that, you know, I do have a job to do and it is how I make my living, but I'm also coming at it from a very different place where it's, it, it, I feel better going and saying, listen, you don't need what I do. This, I, what I do isn't going to do anything for you. You mm -hmm. need insect shield treated clothing for your kids. When you guys are going out to the park, you need, you know, to treat your pets with a, either a topical or a chewable and just be vigilant and have a tick kit in your car. So if, and when you do see a tick, you know how to deal with it, you know, mm -hmm. chemical application in, your, in, in a property like that is not needed. Mm -hmm. How, 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 I don't know how to phrase this, but let's talk about suburban versus yeah. urban. And are you seeing an, a quote unquote uptick in the tick yeah. population in, inside cities now? Yeah. So I do have a, a, a significant number of customers in the Portland area. And, a port, and the Portland area is, again, your, your metropolitan area, small property small lots, most of them well-kept and stuff. But last year was oppressive as far as the tick population. It really got out of control to the point where I couldn't keep up with phone calls. I couldn't keep up with visiting properties. And I would have to tell people, I can't get to you. But there's another person that does what I do. Call him or call them, you know, just because it got so busy. But uh, yeah, you know, I mean, there's several properties in Portland where I treat contiguously, meaning this property owner abuts with this property owner, abuts with this other property owner, because all four properties touch each other mm -hmm. and they're sharing that ecosystem, you know, and there's something out of, out of whack, whether it's, you know, the, the rodent population is too high in that area, something is not right because you know, the, the growth has just been ex exponential, definitely. It was interesting. I was in Atlanta last summer, and I, believe it or not, I look down at my hair, and I see a bug in my hair. I pick it out, and it's a tick. Okay. But I was shocked. I'm here I am in downtown Atlanta. I hadn't been out in the woods or any grassy areas or anything. Then one of the kids that we were with came in the next day with a tick. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, here we are. But I've been hearing a little bit more about now, and I don't know if it's climate change. I don't know if it's just basically, you know, I'm more aware of ticks or, or that there's truly, like you said, something's amiss and, and they're starting to infiltrate into the cities. The rodents would make sense. Yeah, actually. it's so hard to tell what is driving that. And that's why I tell some people, and if they do have like, real evidence of rodent population you know if they have a lot of mice in their area wood piles where they're tending to be and so forth then i try to explain to them that you either have to invite the rodents to the party or take some of the rodents out so you either got to snap trap them or if you want to live trap them with like a five gallon bucket trap relocate them but either way you know, it's something that they have to do. They have to take into consideration because like a TCS box invites them to the party and they're able to kind of coexist and do their thing. And we're removing the ticks from them. Mm -hmm. TCS boxes are kind of like bird feeders for mice. 
they're going to constantly come to it because there's food there. So they are constantly being treated for ticks, which for them is a good thing. And for us, it's a good thing. So for everybody out there, let's talk about what animals typically carry ticks. Yeah. You know, that, and it not only is it the animals that carry ticks, but those vectors, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding about in Maine, especially they think deer tick and they think, oh, deer. So the white tailed deer, the white tailed deer in Maine is at this point, not a vector for Lyme. So a tick that has hatched can bite that deer and feed and still not, you know, transmit that disease to you. So the rodents are really, in my opinion, number one, as far as these vectors that we got to get under control. And in the springtime, you can see the trails in the snow or just under your mulch. If you've had bird feeders and that kind of stuff, you can see they leave roadmaps. You can see Mm -hmm. where they are. So you're able to at least detect that we do have rodent problems in here. And usually in the spring, it's nice to be able to get out to somebody's property and show them, this is what I'm talking about. This shows, and again, they may not have seen a mouse in their house or never seen any rodents, but yeah. they're there. You know? So we're talking mice, we're talking- mice, Chipmunks, uh, gray squirrels. Again, you know, the larger mammals like uh, raccoons, you know, and unfortunately I read an article the other day about possums that that possums, in fact, don't eat the amount of ticks that we thought they did. So we were, yeah, we were wrong about that. So <laughs> possums, uh, you know, of course, white-tailed deer, which are, we here in the state of Maine have a very large population in Southern Maine of white-tailed deer, and they help multiply that tick population dramatically. Where, you know, where I have uh, a little place on the lake uh our culprits are um wild turkey as well believe it or not they don't they tend to carry more of like a lone star type tick but uh you know any animal they can just grab onto and of course human beings are probably you know a huge culprit of just you know We're, we're easy prey for them you think about it we don't have a tough hide We don't have a whole lot of hair. So for us, you know, the ticks probably see us as this meatball, really. I mean, it's exactly for them. So, but definitely, you know, uh, a lot of people don't realize that the the wild turkeys do carry ticks. And one of the ticks that they do carry, and you mentioned, people call it a turkey tick, but it is in fact the Lone Star tick. And we do Mm -hmm. have cases of alpha gal. I have customers that do have alpha gal. A lot of customers that have... Lyme, Babesia, um, Bartonella, Mycoplasma, I mean, you name it. It's surprising to me to meet customers when they call and they're just looking for help. Once I get there and I'm talking to them, if they share that they were bitten or got sick, then I, you know, tell them my story and they're like, wow, same thing happened to me. I can't believe that, you know? Oh, sure. Yeah. It it happens a lot. It's interesting because I had Lyme, you know, went through all the rigmarole and blah, blah, blah. And then I got bit a second time. And the second time was a Lone Star tick. But sure enough, it was on for 10 minutes. They're extremely aggressive ticks. On for 10 minutes, I was able to take it off and then submit it to a lab. I actually sent it to Igenix. They tested it and it was, um, could tell me everything about that tick, every bit of bacteria it was carrying. And it was very helpful, but sure enough, within 24 hours, I start with this flu like symptoms and it took me a good eight months to kind of work through the neurological stuff associated with that. So I just want to remind everybody, it doesn't have to be Lyme. Um, it's (laughs) once you know, the symptoms you know yep. um let's talk about spring camping clothes and yeah. and yep. things like that you know people want to enjoy the outdoors they want to go mountain biking camping all of that what's our best line of defense there yeah so again just because i'm somebody who has been bitten and has been sick before for me i rely on permethrin you know 
again. And, that, and that's a spray that you can actually spray on yeah. your clothes. And I believe you can wash your treated yeah. clothes like six times. They yeah, can help that's you wash they, and dryer. That's what they say. But I, I try to tell people if, if you're, if you have to enter tick habitat and you know that you have to, you know, whether some people are like turkey hunters or, or they're out hunting for deer, if they have a pair of coveralls that they wear when they're hunting, take those first, pull them inside out, spray the inside. A lot of people forget that the ticks will sometimes get in underneath your pant leg and they'll travel inside your clothing, up your leg, trying to find a soft spot to bite. So I tell them to turn them inside out, spray them, let them dry, flip them, you know, the other direction, right side out, spray them, let them dry somewhere out of the sun, flat. And then don't really wash those. You know, if it's a pair of slacks that you wear while you're gardening, the same thing goes. You know, if you know you have to enter that habitat, save those pants for that day you need to mow that back section of your lawn where you've come into contact with ticks before wear those pants on that day and you know if you're going to spray your own you know don't wash them very frequently unless they become soiled just keep them for that purpose okay that's that's really good to know and i can't say enough about insect shield i mean it is by far i, I don't even want to know how many times i've had ticks on me in the field i'll go to properties to measure their property for an application and by the end, I've got three or four dog ticks crawling on my legs. And insect shield treated clothing is commercially treated with permethrin. So if you spray your own clothes, you get five to seven washes out of it. Whereas if it's commercially treated into a pressure system from insect shield, it lasts from the website, they say up to 70 washes. But I tell people kind of err on the side of caution and kind of you know, maybe 45, 50 washes, it will be effective. But they've studied that. And again, the same entomologist, Tom Mathers, uh, studied those. And it is effective, you know, at reducing the, uh, the risk of tick attachments. I think the numbers are 70% reduction in a tick attachment if you're wearing insect shield treated clothing. Mm -hmm. And that's a good number, right? That's really great. I mean, yeah. some people get, once you've had Lyme, you tend to be a little more susceptible to harsh chemicals and whatnot. Yeah. So there you go. We're kind of back at square yeah. one. And you have to just weigh the risk and the reward, especially yeah. with your children. If they, if they're going outside and you want them to be kids and go and play, you might as well go ahead and put that clothing on them. Yeah. Make sure and put your hair back, of course, yeah. for girls. Yeah. And then what about like camping tents and, and yeah. sleeping yeah. bags and stuff like that? Yeah. So in Maine, there's this big camping company. I'm not going to mention their name, but you can purchase uh, tents that have already been treated at that other company's place in North Carolina with permethrin or again you can spray those tents the bottom of that area with permethrin let it dry so that it's safe be careful around cats because permethrin and cats don't mix it's toxic to cats especially while wet but even there's they're sensitive to it even when it's dry so just be careful with cats wow that's good to yeah. know yeah. are there any other tips before we go that you can think of that people may not know or it might surprise people about ticks yeah um or for that matter mosquitoes or you know there are other ways to get lyme disease yeah you know i really think in the future we will eventually get to the point where you know, our landscape architects and our landscaping crews will have to consider tick, the risk of tick habitat in their work because they're the people that are out there doing it. They're the ones that are, you know, probably getting bitten too because they're working in it, but also our customers and the people who live here understand the risk of, of synthetic chemicals in our environment so they want to take those landscape modifications that they can do first. That is always first. So again, you want to look at your property, take a hard look, remove wood piles, uh, look at 
in Maine, a lot of times people would use leaf blowers and they will blow their leaves off into the woods. Well, it's off your lawn, but the problem is you're adding to that tick habitat, mm. you know? So there, I have customers who we have sat down to come up with a plan with no synthetics, no broadcast synthetics, where we will go through their property and I'll tell them, you need to vac out all of this, all of these dead leaves. You have to hire a landscaper to come in here with a big vacuum and vacuum all of this out of here. You don't have to do it every year, maybe every three to four years because it slowly builds up. And that's made a huge, customers have told me that's made a huge difference for their kids and their pets by having that tick habitat gone. Mm -hmm. So if you can remove that habitat, they can't exist there. So there are real world things that you can do that don't cost a lot of money that you're able to do yourself if you have the time. Again, like making sure that you are you have a nice clean line where the end of your lawn is in the beginning of your perimeter. Setting up an area, whether you do like two to three feet a band of cedar mulch or even crushed stone. So that, that does two things it creates a barrier between the active tick habitat and the lawn, the place where you recreate. And it also sends a visible signal to your kids. This is where we stop playing. Mm. We only go up to this line. We don't cross this area of crushed stone and go in there. We don't cross this area of, you know, mulch to get in there. If somebody kicks a ball, we ask dad or somebody to go get it so that we don't go crawling around in there and come out with ticks on us. Mm -hmm. Again, these are properties that opt for no chemical, you know, or a synthetic application. These things do help. Mm -hmm. um, the other reason that you could use like a barrier of like mulch, if you were worried about, you know, your area that abuts your property, that may be a wetland, you put a, you know, two to three foot barrier of cedar mulch down, and then you just apply a synthetic to that area, only that area of the mulch, so that you know you're not putting anything out there close to that wetland area, but also you know that the ticks are not going to be able to cross that. They'll, they'll start to cross that, and uh, they'll desiccate, and they'll die because it's too difficult for them. And I would imagine, I'm guessing, uh, an invisible fence for pets. Yeah, it's huge. Might, and just yeah. to follow along yeah. that perimeter line so that they're not going out and about and bringing it all back in. Yeah, so a lot of customers, I recommend the invisible fence because as pet owners, we don't want to constantly be picking up number twos. So they want an area where their dog can go do number two and they don't have to go in there and pick it up all the time. I get that. The problem is a lot of times they will run their invisible fence 15 to 20 feet into the woods and the dog's got, you know, free reign of that whole area. That's active tick habitat. So if you can pick a section that is five, five to six feet deep, just a little bit in that perimeter area so that you don't have to constantly be picking up number twos, we can treat that area. So hmm. now we know we can see the area where the dog's going to do their business and we can get to it and treat it so that there are fewer ticks in that area than there would be. That helps the dog survive without, you know, getting a lot of tick bites or issues and bringing ticks into the house, but also it's easier to work with. So there have been customers that will call, uh, you know, some of the invisible fence places and have them pull back the fence because it goes way down into the woods and they'll have to retrain their dogs so they're not running all the way through there. But again, you're right. That's another great option for them to restrict the area that they allow their pets to go to, to give them an area where it is wooded so they can do their business, but don't let the dog just, you know, have the whole area to themselves because they will find ticks and they will bring them in. Oh yeah, they will. Yeah. And then they're on your couch and on your bed and all the, all of that. Uh, it's 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 a big job, but we're really grateful to people like you that take it seriously and that want to just basically help people and help prevent 
all of the headaches that you had to go through um, with your own story. Yeah. And, and I try to offer them also a, the service if if they're a client that I work with and they're unsure of, of ticks. And I often want, when I'm there, I'm like, oh, do you know the difference between dog and deer tick? And sometimes they're like, yeah, I think so. You know, and then I usually, you know, I can hand them a, a tick ID card from the state of Maine that shows them each tick. And I say, well, this is a deer tick and at least get them to understand that there are different ticks and each tick has a different risk level. Um, you know, it, it helps for them. And then also if they're not sure, but they were either bitten or they saw a tick, I always tell them, take a picture from the top down. If you can take a picture of it so it's clear, send it to me. I can tell you exactly what it is and where to send it. And we're fortunate in Maine that we have the Maine Tick Lab. And it's $15 for Maine residents to send their tick to the University of Maine at Orno. And they'll test it for Lyme, Babesia, and Ehrlichiosis. Wow. Yeah. You're lucky. I don't we think are. all of our states have that. No, we are very lucky. We are very fortunate. And, uh, you know, I just, I, will you let everybody know where you can be found and reached and all of that good yep. stuff? Yeah. So my website is northwoodstick.com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Facebook. Um, I'm actively on there answering questions, posting preventative things. Um, I try to make my rounds with the local TV stations. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in the springtime, most of the time they'll call and We'll set up an interview with a customer and, and show them what's new and so forth. But uh, I, I'm I'm out there, you know, yeah. I'm doing what I can. It, I'm fortunate that I'm able to do this because in another, in another couple of weeks, I'm going to be so busy. I'm not <laughs> even going to have time to answer the phone. Well, and we need you guys out here in California because, you know, California was never... Yeah ever and still remains people, you know, our doctors just do not have that as a basic, you know, a check, a check that you put it in the checkbox when somebody presents with neurological problems, but we're now seeing them on the beaches. Yeah. Ticks in Northern California are on the beaches now. So yeah. we've got a lot of work to do, but yeah. with people like you out there, you know, you're, you're paving the way, you're get, bringing awareness to a big community and we just need to keep spreading the words. We thank yeah. you so much. Oh yeah, you're, you're so welcome. And my customers are, I have the best customers <laughs> in the world. I'm telling you, they really are great. And it's funny because they know I'm so into ticks. <laughs> And I, yeah. will get, I will get pictures. I had a friend who was a customer who was uh, traveling and they took a picture of a bug and they said, is this a tick? And I said, where are you? And he <laughs> said, well, I'm in Las Vegas. And I'm like, where are you staying? And he mentioned this place he was staying. I said, that's a bed bug. <laughs> yeah. so that's another bug. You know? You're a handy friend to have around. Yeah. That's for sure. Well, I thank you for your time and we will, um, you know, spread the word out there and, and just thank you for all you do for our community. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you all for right. doing what you do. Absolutely. Of course. All right. We'll talk soon. Thanks.